everybody. We have Rick Maschek here with us, and he was part of the search and rescue operation on Ju in July 19th after 13-year-old Jared went missing in Southern California. Now, Rick, can you give us a little bit of a background on what your role was during the search for Jared? Yeah, I was with the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Desert Rescue Squad. Our team was uh, located out of Barstow, California and we are primarily a, a desert team. And as the search expanded, they start calling in more and more teams to help with the search. The search had been going on for a few days and all of search and rescue in California is done by volunteers. And they get called off of uh, their jobs, employment, and they search for a while. And depending on the terrain, they start to get burned out. They get tired and exhausted. And if the search continues, they start calling in other teams, uh, generally from the county. And if the search continues uh, for a long time, they start uh, doing mutual aid, calling in teams from other counties. Uh, we were called in a few days after the search had started. And we were helicoptered in to search for uh, a certain area, location. And during that time, they would fly teams in in the morning and then start flying teams back out in the afternoon. And we were going to be one of the last teams to be flown out that first day that, that I was on the search. And apparently, a team found some bear scat and the helicopter was diverted to pick it up to look to see if, uh, if it had human remains in it. And so unfortunately, the, uh, it was getting dark and they said we'd have to stay out for the night. Um, so we, we did that. We made the, uh, the night out uh, as, as best as we could. We were expecting to be flown out, you know, in the afternoon, evening. So most of the people that uh, I had gone in with uh, didn't have much as far as uh, sleeping bags or anything. Um, I refused to go in without at least a 24 hour pack. So I, I was the only person that uh, had uh, nighttime stuff to keep me warm and the others built a little fire to keep themselves warm. In the morning, they were flown out, and since I was a school teacher, and I had a pack with me, um, and this was summertime, I was off, so I asked if I could be uh, attached to some other teams. And so for the next week or so, um, I would join other search teams in the field. And so I got to search a few different areas. Uh, on the mountain at the time. So could you give us a little detail about the type of terrain that you were searching and um, if, if you could or if you remember even where they had you searching and, and what was like the impetus for searching certain areas just because some of our listeners are unaware of how search and rescue operations run and we would like to hear it from from you someone who's been involved in these uh, quite a bit. Okay, San Gregorio is a 11,000 foot uh, mountain. It's the tallest peak in Southern California. Um, made up mostly of a, a lot of loose rock uh, and vegetation, uh, chaparral type vegetation, manzanita, other things. And it does have uh, you know, some tall pine trees uh, lower on the mountain. Uh, except for trails that enter the mountain, it's pretty, pretty rugged because uh, you're dealing with a lot of loose broken rock. We have a lot of earthquakes in Southern California and so the mountains tend to be broken up. Uh, also uh, covered with uh, vegetation when we don't have fires burn it off. So generally going off trails in our mountains in Southern California is a pretty grueling ordeal. Uh, when I was a lot younger, I used to climb peaks that didn't have trails on them. And sometimes I would find myself literally climbing on top of thick, heavy brush or occasionally crawling under the brush uh, because that was easier to, uh, to navigate. Uh, and I could see, having experienced that when I was younger, 
I could see how he could have got himself into a situation where he was in heavy brush trying to get down off the mountain. Okay, I know when um, they talked about some of the eyewitness accounts, there was a, a statement that Jared was seen by another hiker cutting switchbacks on the way down the trail. Can you explain why that could have potentially been a very uh, bad thing for him to be doing? Okay, on, on a lot of mountain trails, uh, especially if they're steep, they use a lot of switchbacks, which is kind of zigzagging back up the mountain. And I used to be on some trail maintenance projects, and it takes a bit of work making trails that are easy to, uh, tra to traverse. And so we really don't like when people cut the switchbacks, because what they do is they start eroding the trail. And from what I heard, the last person that saw him was an off-duty firefighter coming down the mountain and saw him cutting the switchbacks and told him that he shouldn't be doing that. And he continued on. And that was the last time somebody had heard, had heard or seen Jared. Uh, unfortunately, I think what probably happened was Jared continued cutting switchbacks because it's a little shorter doing that. And he cut the last switchback and there wasn't any more switchbacks and he kept going down the mountain um, off the trail. Okay, so you don't think like it, it wouldn't have been like a fall per se, but if he's off trail and he's kind of going through brush, he could have continued going through brush and never rejoined with the actual footpath? Well, that's what my own feelings are. Because okay. they searched the, the area um, around that location and several hundred feet below the trail, um, they found some, I think it was candy wrappers or something like that, that they uh, found were, was his. And they continued searching down that, if you want to call it a canyon or, or ravine, uh, a certain distance and then it started getting dark and they called in more teams to, uh, to search that area. And that's where I was added to a team of Marines from 29 Palms to search and rescue. And our job was to go down that uh, canyon to a place where there was some waterfalls and uh, search uh, using ropes, search the uh, road, uh, waterfall area, the rocky area, to see if he may have uh, slipped and fallen below that. Okay, and you guys didn't, you guys didn't find any signs or anything, because I know you mentioned that they found the candy wrappers, and then later they found a camera where they developed some photos, and in the last photo they assumed was after he had gone missing it was a, a self photo where he just pointed it and it was a picture of his face and it seemed like it was dark in the background um did you guys come across any of that type of stuff or were you just put in the areas to search where those things were found so they, they narrowed that search area down yeah the wrappers and camera had already been found okay we were uh, sent down further down below that to search in particular uh these cliffs with the waterfalls the, uh, the Marine team that I was on was a new team kind of put together. And as we were starting to set up our ropes, uh, I heard thunder and lightning up above. And I told everybody we had to get out of the uh, ravine. And shortly after that came a big torrent of uh, boulders and muddy water raging down, a uh, flash flood. Oh, geez. And about uh, five minutes later, it, it kind of diminished back to uh, nothing. And we continued setting up our ropes. And then we heard a call on the radio that a blue canteen was found about five miles below us. And apparently, Jared had a blue canteen with him. And so the Marines hearing that, OK, they, they found his canteen below us, so he's down below. And so they start gathering their ropes back up. And I asked the uh, lieutenant that was in charge of them that we continue our job of searching the cliffs because until we got called off. And at that time, the, the Marine guys, they were already headed down the uh, canyon. 
And he said, well, it's going to be hard to get them back up here. <laughs> and so we went, started going down the mountain. And about an hour later, they called and said that wasn't his blue canteen. Oh, so it might have washed out with all, all, with all the, the deluge of water coming down and it was somebody else's? Well, it was, apparently it was, it had been on the mountain for a while. Oh, okay. It wasn't his. So uh, we were already down the mountain quite a ways and the lieutenant didn't want to go back up there. So the search and rescue uh, had to send another team into that area to cover that. Uh, and I was then transferred to another team as, I, like I said, I was a school teacher. And so for about a week, I was uh, attached to different teams searching different areas on the mountain. So in, in the search and rescue effort, um, when they're coordinating it, do they basically pick different areas and then coordinate teams to search like a grid pattern? Or how do you do that on steep cliffs where you're actually repelling to get to certain areas? Okay, since he had been on the trail, and we were assuming that he decided to go back down on his own instead of waiting for the rest of the uh, scout troop to come down. And so essentially they divided up the, the mountain below the trail into search areas, sending search teams into different places below the trail to search. That was the, uh, the one of the places that uh, I first searched with my team uh, when we were sent in. It was a few days later when I talked to one of the search uh, managers that they need to start putting teams in there uh, with uh, at least overnight packs instead of flying people in the morning and then flying them back out in the afternoon. Uh, that was given teams anywhere from three to six hours of search time. And I told them, you know, we should go go in there and, and be in there for at least, uh, you know, overnight in a, in a day or two of uh, searching to search more area. Uh, really rugged area. Um, I keep thinking even today, you what might have happened to him. Uh, it's possible it could have been a rock slide. Uh, it's possible he was in heavy brush and was crawling underneath the brush and just got exhausted, uh, tired out. Uh, a lot of different uh, possible scenarios that could have happened uh, to him. Uh, there was talk about a marijuana grove up there that he might have wandered into that. Uh, you start getting a lot of, you know, strange explanations of, of what could have happened. Sure, and, and I'm sure it's very disheartening when you're finding clues and things to, to kind of point you and say, hey, we're in the right area, but you're still turning up nothing on the individual you're looking for. Yes, and, you know, we're all volunteers, you know, so we're called off from, from our jobs. Uh, at the time, I was a school teacher, so I was fortunate in that, you know, I could spend a week or so, I think it might have been 10 days, mm -hmm. um, on the search. Uh, but most search and rescue people, you know, they're their employers let them off for a few days. Uh, weekends are usually no problem, but uh, like I said, it's, it's a volunteer project. And the sheriff department has a responsibility of the safety of the searchers. And so they're always weighing the uh, possibilities of a searcher being injured or, or killed in looking for a person. And so the longer a search goes on, that weighs into the sheriff department's decision on whether to continue the search or not. Okay, yeah, we've, we've come across that in multiple cases where you, you get to this timeline where based on the type of equipment the individual has and their experience in the wilderness, their age, the temperature, the weather, those types of things, where you get to a point where it no longer is a search, it's more of a recovery mission. And then it, it, it comes down to, unfortunately, sometimes cost and things, which we always hate talking about on the show, but you can't have, you know, thousands of people in an area forever. There has to be a time where it's got to get scaled down and you allow park officials to, you know, hopefully a hiker will come across something or things like that. Um, in your experience, uh, how, how many search and rescue missions have you been a part of roughly, do you think? Oh, uh, yeah, that's uh 
Yeah, that, that's a hard question. I used to be a ranger with the uh, National Park Service in uh, Utah and, and Death Valley and been on some with the Park Service. And I was with San Bernardino County Cert, uh, Desert Rescue Squad. And then I was on Riverside uh, Mountain Rescue. So if I had a guess, I'm thinking, I don't know, 100, maybe more. Okay, so you, you have a lot of experience doing these things. And I, I know you, in a lot of places it is a volunteer organization that, that's coordinated by a more professional one. With the types of volunteers that are out there, is the general experience level pretty high? Is there some people who are relatively new? Uh, just to get an idea of when there's people out searching, um, how good of a job are they doing, I guess I'm saying. Like if they're newer, you know, I don't want to talk about if they're capable of doing it, but newer people tend to, they have a learning curve versus people like yourself who've been a ranger and know what they're doing being out there. What is the general rule of thumb as far as how good the people are that are volunteering? Well, and, and we get the, the total spectrum from new people that want to help and join. And of course, there's a, a training period. And so usually we put new people with the more experienced people, so they're not out there by themselves. Um, a lot of times we'll put uh, newer people, okay, we want you to, to walk this trail if we have no clue where the person is on a mountain. Okay, your job is to walk this trail to see if you encounter the person, call out their name, that type of thing, or maybe stay at a trailhead and, and interview people that hike down the mountain, ask them if they've seen the person and so forth. Uh, more experienced people, uh, we usually send those in to the more difficult areas uh, since they have the experience to do that. So it's, it's not that, you know, we just send whoever shows up into an area. Okay. okay. That's kind of what we, we always have assumed, but uh, it just, it's good hearing it from someone who has the actual knowledge and has done it before. Um, and, uh, oh, go, ahead. Course, go ahead. Of course, it's the, uh, the most experienced people are usually in limited numbers because as you, unfortunately, I tell my students, uh, I mentor university aerospace teams, and I tell them, unfortunately, you live your life learning all this stuff, get lots of experience, and then you die. Yeah. And then new people have to, uh, you know, start the whole process over. All right, so it's kind of that balance of, you know, bestowing some of the, the SAR knowledge upon the newer people uh, as they're coming on to almost outfit the next generation with, with better equipment, better knowledge, better understanding of how it works. Uh, so we don't just constantly have to re- start the whole engine all over again every time. Exactly. And, and when, you, when you join, usually there's a, a, probation peri a probationary period where they kind of evaluate you if you're gonna fit in with the search and rescue type missions and also certain training that, that you have to have before they let you go out into the field. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I do have a question about um, sound. It, um, I don't know the best way to put it, but when you're out calling someone's name in the woods, what is the, the typical distance? So if you're yelling for Jared and you're listing for replies and things like that, is there a certain type of distance based on like thick brush where maybe if you were calling to him, he wouldn't have been able to hear, it, but you're relatively close or in that area, is it relatively noisy? Is it quiet? I'm just trying to think of the odds of if he's injured and trying to call out for help. Um, is it possible if he's under brush that somebody might not have heard him? Um, I don't know about the brush. I'd say it more depends on the terrain and the number of trees and so forth. Okay. Um, I've been on, in places, actually almost on the same mountain, where I was up on a ridge and I yelled out and the guy was maybe a couple miles away down below and he called back <laughs> and it was like oh this is cool and so i kept yelling and he was yelling and and finally uh, you know located him uh, other times uh, i've been on places in the mountains where i've yelled for the person on the end of my rope and we couldn't hear each other whether it was because of the wind the terrain and so forth so it, it really depends on the location how far that works Okay. But it doesn't mean that you don't do it. 
Sure. Yeah, I can imagine because it's, it's always I've I've done quite a bit of mountain climbing myself. Um, my my co-host Mike and I we go out hiking a lot. We do mountain climbing. We're pretty technical as well, so we have experience out in in the backcountry. And I've had relatively the same experience. It feels like sometimes you can hear people from a long ways away, and other times they can be almost around the corner, and you don't even hear them coming or know they're there, even if they're having a radio or talking relatively loud. Okay, at this point, I need to leave. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Well, I want to I want to thank you for uh, doing what you do. Uh, anytime, uh, any kind of uh, education that people get about mishaps that happened in the past uh, that can maybe uh, help them avoid those same things in the future is a good thing. Oh, thank you very much for coming on, Rick. It's always great to hear from someone that's in the field. And again, we we try and focus on teaching people the safe ways to go out into the wilderness and using these types of stories as a warning that you can't just go out there. You have to be prepared. You have to stay on trails and things like that. So thank you again for your time. Uh, it was great talking to you. Okay, you're welcome. Have a good day.